good morning, everybody, and I would like to add my words of welcome uh, to all of you for braving the weather this morning. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Sansad for inviting me to moderate this panel. Uh, my name is Sunera Tobani, and I teach at UBC uh, in the Women's uh, Gender, Sexuality, and Race Studies program, and also now in the Department of Asian Studies. Um, I would like to welcome our two presenters this morning, but let me begin by noting, as this panel very clearly highlights, that we live on indigenous lands here, we live on lands that were stolen from indigenous peoples, and we live on lands where indigenous peoples are struggling for sovereignty. So this recognition of uh, the Coast Salish peoples on whose territories we are living and the Musqueam people where UBC is located is made as a, both as a kind of statement of solidarity for the struggles of indigenous peoples and also as a recognition that uh, many of the uh, immigrant communities, communities that are also racialized, um, have really yet to come to terms with this, what, what the full weight, consequences, and implications of this recognition means. Because uh, one thing that is very clear for anybody who's been working in immigrant communities is that the whole question of settler colonialism, relationship with indigenous peoples, is not part of the dominant uh, political perspective or the political imaginary. So I really want to thank Sansad for highlighting this, this point in, uh, you know, amongst immigrant communities, that the question of being complicit in ongoing genocide of indigenous peoples is a very, very real um, a matter that needs to be uh, taken head on, faced fully. Um, so I'd like to say that I am very pleased that I'm here for this first panel. And with that, I will um, introduce both of our presenters, and I'll introduce them together because uh, uh, they will be speaking one after the other, and I don't want to interrupt um, the flow of the presentation. So the first presenter this morning is Marianne Ignes, and the uh, title of the presentation is um, Cultural Genocide and the Difficult Realities of Indigenous Languages in Canada. Marianne is the director of the First Nations Language Center at Simon Fraser University and is professor in the Department of Linguistic and First Nations Studies, also affiliated with the university's Department of Sociology and Anthropology. She currently directs a seven-year SHRC partnership grant on First Nations language revitalization in BC and Yukon, working with 12 diverse language groups. Her own research has focused on indigenous language revitalization and language policies in Canada. She continues to work with elders and language learners in her home community, Skitchesn, and her adopted community, Old Masset, in Haida Gwaii, and with small quick speakers and learners in Prince Rupert. Her other interests are ethnobotany and indigenous language story work. So welcome. Oh, uh, that's okay. I'm uh, Eldon Yellowhorn, Dr. Eldon Yellowhorn. Uh, I'm the chair of the Department of First Nation Studies at uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, I've been teaching at Simon Fraser uh, since 1998. And uh, I'm originally from the Pikani First Nation, uh, which is Nowhere near here, if you uh, go directly east of Vancouver and once you exit the Rocky Mountains and you're out on the prairies, that's where I'm from. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry, many apologies for the mistake. And uh, we'll begin with the first uh, presenter. Okay, thank you. Wait, hide up. Jutschen etlas, Suschen etlas, Heimstetten, je ende de Kalmuch, de Wach, ne Elien Tmich, es Lauien Pupsmen, es Wickelmen, es Schlittendem, ne Elie, je ende Tin, es Hochheute Kalmuch, ne Elie. I uh, just said in my home language, the Quatmuchin, that uh, I also honor the uh, indigenous peoples of this place, the Coast Salish people, on whose unextinguished lands we are. And 
I'm also happy that you in invited me to this conference uh, to present on the difficult realities of indigenous languages in Canada. The language that I addressed you in, which is my husband's and my family's language, uh, is spoken by about 100 people who were blessed and lucky to be still raised with the language, despite the adversities of Indian residential schooling. And uh, after those 100, that's it for first language speakers. Uh, and we're doing our best to uh, train and work very hard to uh, nourish a new generation of uh, learners and second language speakers, and most of all, users of Sukhwamukchin. My other adopted language uh, that uh, I was uh, fortunate to uh, be introduced to when I was a graduate student uh, at uh, SFU in the late 1970s, early 90s, uh, early 80s, um, is Hatkil, the uh, Massa dialect of the Haida language. And uh, Haida is actually much worse off than Sukhwamukchin. Uh, we have in the Massa dialect a total number of about five speakers left. Uh, my uh, friend and collaborator, Lawrence Bell, with whom I've worked for some uh, decades on, uh, on language revitalization and uh, uh, documentation, uh, is the last male speaker. He literally doesn't have another speaker to speak to. And so that, again, presents the challenge for those that I work with, uh, young or not so young adults, uh, to get good enough in the language so that we can use it with one another. As uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of, in 2015, when the Truth and Reconciliation Report on Canadian Indian Residential Schools was first released, Justice Murray Sinclair referred to the decades of enforced assimilation wrought on Indigenous peoples in Canada as cultural genocide. And Chief Justice Beverly McLachlan uh, noted, in the buzzword of the day, assimilation was the language. In the language of the 21st century, it is cultural genocide. Uh, so it was uh, with the TRC that the word of cultural genocide in, in terms of uh, the uh, plight of indigenous languages and cultures and peoples uh, was put on the table. And of course, at its core, cultural genocide was linguicide. It included the calculated destruction of indigenous languages spoken by indigenous peoples in Canada. Before I go on, I would like to uh, acknowledge and uh, pay tribute to the elders from diverse First Nations languages uh, who have taught me about the value and the uh, really the magic of uh, indigenous languages as spoken by elders and pe uh, people that have maintained them uh, that inc include incredible wisdom uh, that literally goes back 10,000 years. I'll tell you a little bit about myself just in a nutshell. I'm uh, not uh, indigenous from this place or this continent. I was born uh, in what arguably is uh, an sort of enclave of uh, people uh, that has lived in place for the last at least 5,000 years in northwest Germany with our own language, uh, Frisian and uh, Plattdeutsch as well. And uh, I began working in the Haida community uh, in Old Masset 35 years ago, where I was adopted uh, into the Ao Yaklanas uh, clan as Kul Kilket. And uh, I began research and raised a family in the Sukhwapmuk community in the interior uh, in the 1980s, since the 1980s uh, and have worked on Sukhwapmuk documentation and revitalization as a parent community member and researcher. And my interest and passion in, is in the intersection of language and culture and how language reflects and embeds cultural knowledge, wisdom, protocols and practice. And uh, I'm really interested in how speakers of particular indigenous languages deploy linguistic forms to say things in an appropriate, interesting, poetic, and rhet rhetorical way. So just briefly to remind ourselves of uh, the incredible linguistic diversity we have here in British Columbia, although uh, it doesn't quite match up uh, 
to the linguistic diversity in East Asia, including India. But nonetheless, uh, within North America, we're considered the hotbed of linguistic diversity. We have, uh, depending on how you count it, some 32 different languages in what is now the, what's the province of BC, which of course is an artificial boundary. And uh, each of those languages has anywhere from two to several different dialects. Um, and as I said earlier, we're at a critical time in terms of uh, the state of our languages. Uh, this uh, chart here is from a report by the uh, First Peoples uh, Heritage Language and Cultural Council from uh, 2010. And it shows uh, that across the board in, of indigenous languages in Canada, uh, at that time, less than 6% of indigenous peoples uh, in BC were able to speak their language. And because those uh, people are and, or were elders, by and large, 60s and over, the uh, elders who are left uh, in, uh, in Masset who still speak Haida Gwaii uh, are in their late 80s and 90s. And uh, so turn the clock, we're now in 2016 and you see where the blue line is going. But Despite that, and the kind of uh, grief that afflicts uh, those that, are, that care about languages and that want to preserve them, uh, we, we do have hope. The orange line shows that uh, with uh, resourcing and uh, a kind of an all-hands-on-deck approach, we can turn it around by nourishing second language speakers. When it comes to the uh, reasons for linguicide, uh, of course, it was the uh, residential schools in Canada that were the single biggest factor in this and that were at the core of this dis decline. Uh, one of uh, my elder friends uh, said, I was punished quite a bit because I spoke my language. I was put in a corner and whipped, and sometimes <coughs> I was just given uh, bread and water or they try to embarrass us and put us in front of the whole class. So this is just one little piece of testimony among many others that uh, came out with the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and uh, previously during the uh, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples and in other avenues. Uh, in uh, the 19, late 1990s, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation uh, first began uh, providing funding to seek remedies uh, for, uh, and healing from uh, the loss of Aboriginal, uh, of, uh, that was uh, uh, inflicted through res residential schools. But unfortunately, at the time, they provided no funding for revitalizing Aboriginal languages. Um, we had the uh, government apology and common experience payment in 2008. Uh, and of course the Truth and Reconciliation Commission since, and I'll, I'll get back to that later. Uh, in 2003 and 2005, uh, between 2003 and 5, the uh, federal government uh, launched a task force on Aboriginal languages and cultures, I don't know if any of you remember that, uh, which uh, made uh, a set of uh, about 100 recommendations on how to allocate the $160 million that for the first time the Canadian federal government had put on the table to revitalize indigenous languages. And uh, they were actually also uh, uh, developing plans to create a long-term endowment foundation for revitalizing languages. Uh, when the uh, then new conservative government uh, came into power in uh, summer 2005, that money was uh, basically wept, wiped off the table and uh, no longer existed. So we've lost 15 or 10 years of valuable time since then. Um, besides residential schools uh, that literally beat the language out of three generations of children, uh, there were other factors that came into play uh, since the 1960s and 70s when residential schools were shut down. In 1969, when uh, the uh, federal government, uh, together with the provinces, launched the so-called integration of education and schooling of in, uh, Aboriginal children. Uh, 
there was not even an ounce of talk about bilingual schooling. It just was not even on the table. It wasn't mentioned. And of course, uh, people have said with the uh, increasing uh, importance of English in the workplace as indigenous peoples, people needed to find employment, English has often been termed the killer language that has pushed indigenous languages aside. And uh, I want to also alert you to the fact that the situation for indigenous languages is very different than for minority heritage languages. We don't have a homeland where we can send our children or adults to, to immerse themselves in the language and to get really good in it. Uh, a homeland where everybody speaks the language and learners can be immersed. Uh, the only place we have is our First Nations homelands where the language is critically endangered and spoken by only a few, usually elderly people. Um, so it, that's very, very different than having a place to still immerse our kids. That's the land that our people came from. Um, so I've, uh, how much time do I have? About 10 minutes. Okay. We have another 10 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, at the heart of the causes for the devastating language loss within the past 80, 90 years experienced by Canadian Indigenous communities and individuals are residential schools that aimed at eradicating the use of Indigenous language and cultural practices. Examples of testimony of residential school survivors from BC including uh, the uh, Kamloops Indian Residential School, which is uh, near my home and where nearly all my relatives went, uh, that, predate, uh, that well predate, uh, this was a class action suit that I'm referring to here, where the federal government, uh, until just a year ago, was still fighting that day scholars uh, should receive compensation from, uh, for attending residential schools and uh, being chastised for speaking their languages. So they were uh, alienated from their culture, they were threatened with hell, their languages were devaluated, and their communities' cultural practices uh, were called heathen, unworthy, and primitive. And uh, so given these kind of factors, uh, it's that legacy that lingers to this day uh, with those that experience the losses. And it's a, it's a very different thing uh, for somebody, a young person, to learn a language, to become a tourist, to seek employment in other parts of the world, as compared to the kind of uh, emotional and cultural baggage that indigenous peoples in communities have in the face of uh, the language literally being taken away from them for two to three generations prior to them. And I want to uh, just briefly also alert you to what is lost when indigenous languages are lost. Uh, contemporary research in linguistics and cognitive psychology has taken us on new paths of learning about the way languages not only refract cultural experience, but also shape the way we think, perceive, and organize the world in culturally meaningful ways. Among the diversity of languages, including the several thousand indigenous languages on earth, each, as the quote says, contains a way of perceiving, categorizing, and making meaning in the world, an invaluable guidebook developed and honed by our ancestors. And uh, it's, so it, it's that part about the way that a language uh, embeds knowledge and categorizes, perceives it, that is lost uh, when people no longer speak that language. And uh, as uh, the well-known uh, linguistic anthropologist Peter Mühlhäuser said, uh, the moment that you cannot name the things in your environment anymore in your ancestral language, that knowledge itself is not there the way it was when it was uh, articulated in the language, in its uh, full breadth and diversity. And. Uh, Learning of First Nations language then is also good for you because of the strong connection be between First Nations language maintenance and several factors that affect personal and collective health and well-being. So we have in recent years, uh, through studies by Chandler and Lalonde, Hallett and others, uh, evidence that of the connection between linguistic maintenance and spiritual, uh, cultural as well as physical health. Um, and also health in a holistic sense. 
uh, we have ample evidence that uh, languages, including indigenous languages as home languages, uh, play an important role in education. Uh, in a study on the state of Aboriginal learning in Canada, a holistic approach to measuring success, uh, the uh, important role of Aboriginal language education was emphasized, emphasized as providing, uh, improving and enhancing the educational experiences of Aboriginal youth. And it describes how, quote, knowledge of ancestral languages is key to how Aboriginal people view learning, a process that is lifelong and extends well beyond the classroom. As the report describes, ancestral language is considered a key source of knowledge for First Nations learners, as it helps transmit knowledge and values from one generation to another. So in other words, uh, the uh, verdict from social sciences, uh, psychology, and so forth is well out, uh, and cognitive uh, linguistics and cognitive psychology, that language learning is good for you and especially on the heels of the past learning and relearning one's indigenous language. And, uh, but the question lingers, what is being done about that and what is being done by uh, the, the state and its uh, organizations. The uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission included specific recommendations on uh, maintaining and revitalizing indigenous languages, noting that we call upon the federal government to acknowledge that Aboriginal rights include Aboriginal language rights. The uh, TRC called for an Aboriginal Languages Act, which in fact the uh, 2003 to five uh, task force on Aboriginal languages and cultures had, as had the RCAP from uh, 1996, uh, to uh, acknowledge language as a right, to provide resourcing, uh, and that language revitalization needs to be done by Aboriginal peoples themselves and reflect the diversity of Aboriginal languages in Canada. They called to appoint an Aboriginal languages commissioner to uh, enforce and monitor this, and they called for the creation of post-secondary programs in Aboriginal languages. So that was June 2015. And uh, we know that the uh, current federal government uh, has uh, announced funding for Aboriginal education and infrastructure. At this point, uh, those of us that are working on indigenous language revitalization are still waiting for any change in resourcing uh, to uh, revitalize Aboriginal languages. But I, I also want to say that uh, just as in the chart I showed you in the beginning, through ample resourcing and support. There, there is indeed hope to uh, train and nurse second language speakers of languages as we're doing and working on through the uh, seven year SHRC grant that I'm directing. And uh, I also want to acknowledge the incredible talent among younger people in our communities uh, and the passion they bring to it uh, when it comes to revitalizing languages. And I'm actually really proud that uh, just in these past uh, several months and starting in earnest this early September, uh, in this very place, we have a Squamish Language Academy that uh, is uh, at work, led by a young uh, speaker and learner, Khalsilam, Dustin Rivers. And we have uh, 14 young people who are doing an eight-month intensive Squamish uh, program, five days a week, uh, six hours a day, uh, until next April to become fluent in the language. And I, I think that's... Uh, a really good example of what can be done, and sometimes in spite of the kind of resourcing that we haven't got, at least yet. And uh, we have some good efforts at SFU as well, uh, and I think some goodwill within the institution. We have just launched a new uh, master's, uh, actually initially a graduate certificate, uh, hopefully to ladder into a master's in uh, the uh, documentation and linguistics of a particular indigenous First Nations language. So uh, with that, there's hope, but more can be done. Thank you. Hello, good morning to you all, and thank you for uh, attending this morning. And I would like to uh, 
welcome you to the homeland of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. Um, my name is Dr. Eldon Yellowhorn. I'm, I'm, not, I'm from Bikani First Nation, and the language we speak is uh, Blackfoot. It's called Blackfoot in English. Uh, and you know, when I was growing up, uh, I grew up in a time on, on the reserve where uh, we didn't have electricity, and uh, so uh, there was nothing to compete with uh, Blackfoot. So I heard that all the time in the community. And then uh, in about 1960, uh, the electrical grid arrived on our reserve, and people started buying uh, radios and televisions. Uh, and then and there's, that's when the erosion of Blackfoot really started to happen in uh, uh, accelerated. Uh, so there's, you can almost draw a line uh, in terms of age. Uh, kids who grew up on the reserve before electricity and before we had radios and television, and kids who grew up on the reserve after we got access to uh, electronic communications like that. Uh, I also have to say, you know, that having grown up in a bilingual household, you know, I'd go to school in the day and uh, hear English, and then Blackfoot was the language uh, in their home. Uh, that this had uh, a beneficial effect on me because in my adult life uh, I've had an opportunity to uh, learn uh, Spanish, German, and French ba based on various places that I've lived. Uh, and having that bilingual training uh, I found has really made it easier for me to learn languages, uh, new languages as an adult. Uh, so my uh, talk this morning is uh, Genocide and First Nation Studies in Canada. Uh, but you know, my uh, background is actually in, in archaeology. Uh, that's what I've been trained to study. That's what I uh, spent my career doing. Uh, and, and once I completed my PhD, I started working on the home community where I'm from, the Pikani First Nation. And you know, kind of looking at the historical experience of uh, Pikani people from uh, Living the mode of life of our ancestors, you know, mobile hunting and gathering culture, relying on the country foods of the, our homeland, uh, and in a one in the space of one generation, uh, they had to make the transition from being those mobile hunting and gatherers uh, to being uh, farmers living in farmsteads and uh, settled communities, and and actually. Uh, replicating the vernacular ar architecture of the white settlers who were. Uh, starting to settle around their community. Uh, so that's kind of been my uh, interest, historical archaeology, you know, using the different modes of uh, material culture studies as well as archival uh, studies, looking for uh, documents, photographs, or illustrations about time periods that I'm interested in. And I started working on the first two generations who settled on the reserve, so basically from 1880 until 1920. And a big part of that was uh, the uh, Victoria Jubilee Home, uh, which was opened in 1897, and, and which was to commemorate uh, Queen Victoria's 60th uh, anniversary as Queen of England. And so the Victoria Jubilee Home, which opened uh, and was operated by the Church of England, uh, it no longer stands, you know, so it was of archeological interest to me and uh, using different techniques uh, to figure out, figure out where on the site we were working, you know, we used this uh, gradiometry, which is like a, a a really, really sensitive uh, mag magnet detector, and it measures the uh, difference. I'm, that's I'm not point, but <laughs> it's a method in archaeology that helps us find stuff. Eh? <laughs> uh, but also, uh, I've been becoming uh, familiar with filmmaking as well. You know, I, I decided that uh, the people I'm working with, who are my constituents. None of them are ever going to read a journal article. They'll probably never crack a textbook if it was there. Uh, but they'll sit down and watch a, a documentary. So I went through the process of becoming a documentary filmmaker uh, and operating it. And if you're interested, I, I did make a, a documentary called Digging Up the Res, Historical Archaeology at Bikani. And I posted it on YouTube. So if you Google that title, uh, you'll see it. It's uh, about a 40 minute long documentary about my work at, uh, at Bikani. Uh, so you know, I'm interested in what I refer to as internalist archeology span because I, I'd say every culture has an internal dialogue about the nature of antiquity. And, and 
we inform our interest in and our present in, in those terms. So telling our own story from our own perspective is internalist archaeology very, very, uh, it, it makes, uh, makes history uh, come alive because people realize that they have a, uh, an interest in that. Uh, well, you know, I want to, when I started working on this uh, presentation, I thought, where am I going to start, you know? And, and then I thought, okay, well, here's a good place to study. The Columbian World Fair uh, in 1893, which was uh, convened in uh, Chicago, and which was an unapolog uh, unapologetic celebration of the 400th anniversary of the Christopher Columbus voyage. You know, and it was, in other words, a, a showcase of American triumphalism. Uh, and this was exemplified by uh, the poem that Walt Whitman wrote in commemoration of that, a poem called A Thought of Columbus. <clears throat> but when you read his thoughts of Columbus, he spares not a thought about the native people who uh, Columbus uh, met there. Uh, but 1893, this was, you know, the uh, idea was also very prominent in American, in the early days of American anthropology, this idea of the vanishing race, you know, that it was just taken for granted that Native people were probably not going to live uh, to the end of the uh, 19th century. And, and this actually informed government policy, you know, like for example, the reserve I'm from, uh, because the population kept falling in the early days of the reserve, uh, the government felt no uh, reason to, uh, not to uh, surrender our, a big chunk of our reserve because it, there were fewer Indians around, they didn't need all that excess land. And so now that the population has rebounded, we're literally bursting at the seams. There's just not enough space on the reserve for everybody. Uh, but I have to also point out, you know, how this idea of uh, genocide became so embedded in the psyche of uh, American society. There's this one little book that I came across. Yeah, I do a lot of archival stuff, and old books kind of interest me, you know. So I read this one called O Ranger, a book about the national parks, written in 1928 by Horace Albright. And I was always amazed by the casual racism that was kind of embedded into his narrative. And in particular, one sentence that really highlighted for me what he, he thought about it. He said, to see Indians in a, in a national park, because in an instant there is a flash of a whole history of Indian fights, the wresting of a continent from a race of red men. Now that was when they didn't have to apologize for genocide, you know. Uh, a century later, you know, uh, 1992, things had changed. Uh, 500 years after Columbus, people were not so willing to celebrate the wresting of the continent from the race of red men. Uh, instead, the world had become familiar with the word genocide. In 1948, the United Nations had adopted both the Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention on the Prevention of and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Now, uh, historians began examining the fate of Native Americans under the rubric of genocide after this uh, period. So uh, this was uh, not coincidental that Dennis Stannard uh, published his treatise, American Holocaust, The Conquest of the New World, in, in 1992. Uh, and he described that na the destruction of Native America as the greatest act of genocide in the history of humanity. And I've never met a Native person, Aboriginal person, who disagrees with that statement. White people, nah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but specifically, Article 2 of the uh, Convention on Genocide, uh, it indicates that in, in the present, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethical, racial, or religious group as such. And then it lists the five uh, different definitions. But it, it's number uh, E, forcibly transferring children of one group to another group. And uh, that kind of, uh, you know, is my point of entry into this discussion. Because, you know, like, why would an archaeologist uh, be involved in this? Uh, well, I just want to quickly, what was happening in, in 1948 in Canada, at the same time that Canada op, uh, opted to acknowledge this? Well, the Indian Act still banned Indians from pursuing justice by hiring lawyers. Uh, they were still disenfranchised from the body, body politic. They couldn't vote in elections or anything like that. Uh, and despite signing on to the UN Declaration and acknowledging Article 2E, uh, Canada was still operating residential schools and placing children in them in a deliberate act of assimilation. And this practice would continue for another 40 years after this date. So this is a long time, you know, and this is what spawned the TRC in Canada, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, 
The part, of the TRC, uh, the part of the settlement agreement on a class action lawsuit launched by survivors of these uh, schools, and it had a mandate to examine the residential school system and to hold testimony from survi survivors. Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, but also, this inquiry also had the central question to determine the number of children who went missing. And that's why they hired an archaeologist to help them with this part of, of the Missing Children's Project. Uh, they came and asked me if I would be interested, and of course, I was not going to say no to them. Uh, so I embarked on this project to start uh, documenting and gathering names, visiting sites to do investigations. Uh, one of the places that I visited was the uh, Spanish Indian Residential School in Spanish Ontario, which is on the north shore of Lake Ontario. And before going there, I had read a couple of books on this. One of them was Basil Johnston's uh, Indian School Days. And I am standing at the same place that he was and looking out over the same, I, you know, his description of that uh, landscape was just amazing. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, but on the left is the uh, cemetery there and, and the monument where the children who died at the school uh, were uh, interred. And there was a one big chunk where, like the Spanish flu epidemic, you could just tell where when it started and when it raced through the school. Um, one of the alumna, alumna of uh, this Spanish Indian residential school uh, was Daphne Ojig. I don't know if any of you, how many of you here know who Daphne Ojig is? Eh, a couple of people. Well, uh, she was the only female member of the art collective known as the Indian Group of Seven. They defined a whole aesthetic of native art that you can see the second and third generation iterations of it everywhere in uh, popular culture for native people. Um, some of her artwork was commemorated in a uh, special stamp collection that was issued by uh, Canada Post. I, I collect stamps, by the way, and so <laughs> this was of interest to me. Uh, she, was, uh, uh, she attended the residential school at uh, Spanish Ontario in the 1930s, and she just died just at the beginning of October this month uh, at the age of 1997. So she lived to, to be a, a very elderly person. There's only one other person from that original group of seven who's still alive, and his name is Alex Janvier uh, from Alberta. Uh, I, I did see a, a picture of Daphne when she was uh, a student at the school. And it was a winter time, and she was figure skating. Well, um, another another school that I uh, investigated at was this one called Shubenacadie Residential School, a little village called Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia. And just west of there is an uh, Indian Brook uh, Indian Reserve, and a lot of the uh, children from that reserve and other, and other places from the Maritimes uh, were brought to this school. Uh, in the, this was the only, the only residential school in the Maritimes as well. But it was also one of the schools where experiments were done on the ch children. Um, in specifically um, to see the effects of nutritional uh, deprivation. Um, so while I was there, I met uh, Isabel Knockwood, uh, and she was, turned out, I learned later that she was one of the students who was uh, the subject of these experiments. Um, I kept in touch with her after the work I did, you know, I, I, we exchanged letters, and Late in her life, she's taken up new hobbies, you know, and she's taken up, uh, she went to a, started taking drawing classes, and she sent me one of her first uh, efforts. You know, I, I wish her well. Uh, so, the result of this work from uh, the missing children and burial information are the calls to action uh, that made it into the TRC uh, final report. Um, which 
talk about the uh, Native students there and uh, what uh, ought to be done by uh, Canada. The calls to action uh, 71 to 76, which made it into the TRC report. Uh, well, uh, you, can, you can tell they were written by an archaeologist because they're uh, all about uh, trying to work with cemeteries and uh, unknown persons. Uh, and from the work that we did, we uh, were able to say that approximately 4,000 students' uh, deaths were documented, but this is a, a low-end number uh, because there are still so many out there that uh, cemeteries that have been uh, forgotten and remained out on the, out on the land. And there's a concerted effort now to try and uh, reclaim those cemeteries. Uh, but a, a big part of the work is also about uh, commemoration. And this is uh, Mount St. Elgin, which is just a few miles east of London, Ontario. Uh, and the reason for this place is that uh, it is the ground zero for the residential ex school experience. Uh, this was the first residential school built in Canada in, in, well, before there was a Canada in 1838. And uh, the uh, people who are the uh, Muncie, Delaware, uh, on whose reserve the school is situated, have created this really nice monument there. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a very nice place to, to sit and uh, contemplate the past. Uh, well, uh, when we, what's the next, you know, like when we finished our work, we realized that two people going around doing this work was not nearly enough. And one of the places we did visit was uh, Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, which was built on the site. In fact, that building that you see in the background, that is uh, part of the university. But that's the old residential school. It's been built into the architecture of the university. Uh, and it was built on the, uh, inspired by Chief Shingwak, who was an Abish Anishinaabe uh, chief in that area, and who actually lobbied to have the school built there. He called it a teaching wigwam, uh, where his children could learn the skills that would help them uh, survive the, uh, into the, the new social order that was uh, growing up around him. Uh, so I'm in a position in the university that I can uh, teach other students, uh, to teach students who can carry on this work. Uh, I'm getting to the end of my career. I'm getting, I can uh, see her, uh, retirement on the horizon, let's put it that way. So between now and then, uh, I have an opportunity to, uh, well, teach students to carry on this work. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much for your presentations. Uh, can we take five minutes? Okay, we'll take five minutes uh, for questions and answers. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, I'll give you a minute to think about what you might want to bring up. Okay, Sid. Okay, so while Sid is doing that, maybe I'll ask you each a question, yeah? So the first question for Marianne is, um, you know, you, you raised the point that language revitalization is also has to deal with the whole issue uh, of a different way of being in the world, a different consciousness, words that cannot be translated, meanings that cannot be translated. And I'm wondering whether the Shirk project is able to take on some of that work where it's not just a kind of instrumentalization of the whole project of language revitalization, but how, how to keep that whole kind of way of knowing and being that language uh, enables, you know, how you actually do that in your project. So that's the question for you. And the second question I have is, you know, the TRC, amongst all the other things that it is and it did, is also telling Canada a narrative about itself, right? And I wonder if you can say something about how you think that narrative has been received or not. <laughs> yeah? 
to be Should here we with take the question all the questions the together? Okay. So we have two questioners there. We'll take the questions and then maybe you can answer them together. Uh, one comment in terms of uh, Eldon's uh, laying out of the history of the 20s and the, uh, the 90s and the commemoration of the 400th anniversary. I remember at that time hearing the comment by Noam Chomsky, and he was referring to the, the, gen the Holocaust. And at that time, and as my state of ignorance that existed at that time, I thought that was an extreme statement. So I have personally undergone a bit of enlightenment since that time. Um, Marianne, you're talking about the cancellation of $160 million. Was that part of the Kelowna Accord? No. Um. It, it preceded that, and it was an entirely different initiative. Uh, the um, task force on uh, Aboriginal languages and cultures uh, was launched, which my husband actually headed up uh, in 2003 to five, uh, Chief Ron Ignace. And uh, it came about out of uh, initially lobbying that he and through the AFN carried out since the late 1990s on the, 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 the plight and situation of Aboriginal languages. Um, and uh, so that's when uh, I think it was Minister Sheila Kopp at oh. the time who headed up uh, the uh, Department of Canadian Heritage then uh, made the announcement uh, of, I think it was $165 million, and the task force spent about five million uh, holding hearings across the country in uh, Inuit, First Nations, and Métis communities for two years, producing an extensive report, which I think is still on the uh, Department of Canadian Heritage uh, website, although a bit buried. and. Um, so uh, the, the task force then, over those two years, completed its work, uh, submitted a report with uh, a large number of uh, uh, timely recommendations, well articulated. And uh, it was during that time then, like right after the submission of the report, that governments changed. Mm. Uh, and uh, the conservative government came into power. And uh, nothing in the next three months in terms of implementation uh, and follow-up uh, happened. And it was kind of by coincidence that, I think it was in December 2005, or it could have even been 2006, uh, the uh, NDP um, Aboriginal Affairs critic Charlie Angus uh, raised the issue about what happened to the task force and what happened to the 160 million. Uh, in the House of Commons, and uh, the then Minister of Canadian Heritage, uh, Bev Oda, said, oh, they never made any recommendations, and the money was no longer on the table. Uh, as quick as that. Oh. And it, it, uh, I, I feel uh, also during that time, uh, which uh, also had to do you know, with the Kelowna Accord and all those things, the attention began to be turned towards uh, economic and social disparities. And unfortunately, uh, and th that even includes the uh, <laughs> AFN and other indigenous uh, organizations, uh, the way things became construed was that language was one thing, kind of sitting over here as a uh, kind of on the fringes. And here were the realities of uh, social economic disparities that needed to be addressed but at the cost of paying or separating the two out, uh, out as though they should not be connected. So it's kind of a pretty sad legacy that happened. Okay. Good morning. Thank you very much for your uh, eloquent uh, presentation. My name is Gabe Korajan. I immigrated to Canada 40 years ago from Ethiopia. I'm of Armenian heritage. Since then, I have been touched and actually spent a lot of time with First Nations people, starting from Yellowknife to Alberta to the Mohawks in, uh, in Quebec. My observation is that the shocks that the First Nations people have gone through, starting from total extermination plans of the First Nations people from North American land to cultural genocide. And then the one that I like is linguicide, is what you mentioned, my first mm -hmm. time to hear it. 
We Armenians have gone through the same experience of the Turkish massacre and the genocide that was committed on us. What we have done as a small nation and an insignificant, desperate nations living all over the world after ge genocide was to establish small, very small centers to train our children. Mm -hmm. Number one, their language. And number two, their religion. No matter where you go, even in Ethiopia, when we were 30 at the turn of the century, the first thing our elders did and women, you know, community, wives, concerned people, was to establish small Saturday schools to teach the children the language. It is being done also in Vancouver right now. And this young men who just walked in are quite responsible for enhancing the language. If you don't put that energy to revitalize the language, the culture, and the identity will die. And a lot of it, is, I think, does not require really too much resources. Mm -hmm. It requires the determination, the leadership of young, elderly, to bring together groups of people like the eight that started the uh, Squamish. So what I'm saying is why is it that, of course, against the background of all that terror that went on this nation, the residential schools, it's very hard to expect any normal behavior. Nevertheless, why is it that people don't take ownership in First Nations communities and start these little schools to teach their children the language? Thank you. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Eldon and Marianne, thank you. This, this may be a, a bit of a follow-up to that question before. Uh, I have the honor of working with Sylvia McAdam of Idle No More and Leanne Beresamasaki Simpson of Elderville First mm -hmm. Nation. Uh, both these warrior women speak of uh, what they say is the final stage of, of cultural genocide, which they, they say is when the oppressor can in fact release their grip over the oppressed and the, their efforts to silence the victimized because the oppressed have begun to hate their own tongue. Mm -hmm. So I welcome your reflections on that and how it indicates just how remarkable it is uh, that despite these odds and the forces of colonialism in Canadian society and culture and politics, that nonetheless First Nations persons and communities have in fact resisted that and begun the work of reclamation and rematriation. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. I think you've partly answered <laughs> uh, the first gentleman's question. Um, I, for one thing, I agree with you, it's, and, and that's really in that spirit that the uh, 22 different First Nations organizations and representing 12 to 14 languages have kind of come together through this partnership that we've created. Uh, it's about uh, doing those kind of things in spite of the adversities and in spite of the constraints that are that have been imposed first of all through the linguicide itself and uh, secondly through the lingering adversities uh, on the part of uh, the Canadian state um, and we, we have those kind of things uh, that uh, passionate and enterprising young or not so young uh, indigenous activists have done in many different places across the country. The, the Squamish Academy is one example. And it didn't come because somebody put $100,000 on the table and said, uh, oh, uh, we have money to offer, can you do something? It came about entirely out of the passion and commitment of a small number of people and then institutionally figuring out a way to make it work. And, and I believe that's often how we succeed. But uh, there, there is also the, uh, the deprivation, the grief, the linger, and what, what you said, 
this being turned against indigenous people as uh, just like, I forget how you said it, uh, hating your own language or your own self for not being able to speak it. And we definitely have that uh, among many of our adults. And, and, and that's why I said earlier, it's, uh, it's not that we come to it without baggage. And I, I fully understand too with Armenians, of course, there is the baggage of the physical genocide and all those, uh, you know, what, whatever that produced. Um, and uh, so it, it, I, I think it's a difficult thing. We, we do need resources to do this. We, do, we need resources to uh, digitize the thousands and thousands of hours of what are literally the last legacies of speakers of the languages. Uh, and do we not deserve a role in education that uh, reinstills the language if the, uh, the white system uh, usurps uh, millions and millions of dollars for English and French. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not saying, uh, you know, don't just get on with it, but, but I, I think it's a matter of uh, where the power sits and uh, the uh, disparity in uh, what is put into the plight of indigenous languages. Uh, so I think the question was about the uh, national narrative of Canada. And actually, this is a good time to answer that question because uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm old enough to remember when Canada celebrated its centennial. <laughs> and I, mean, I mean, I was just a young boy at the time, but uh, you know, I was privy to it through television and all that. Uh, and I have to say, at, at Canada's centennial, uh, you know, I've studied Canadian history about the fur trade, and you know, I've even written about it, you know, uh, in my scholarly work. So I'm very well versed with that narrative that Canada had convinced itself of uh, in 1967, uh, that narrative about, you know, the brave explorers going out there to discover a, a wilderness out in the Western uh, continent. Uh, and all of that, you know, uh, is changing now because Canada is changing. Canada is becoming more diverse, and people who are coming to Canada now have no loyalty to that historical narrative about the white man and the Indians. Uh, you know, when I grew up in southern Alberta, uh, there really was no diversity. The only, the only diversity was the Indians and Hutterites, and the Hutterites were white. <laughs> uh, so... When I go to southern Alberta uh, these days, you know, it's, it's surprisingly cosmopolitan. There's more, I mean, like racism is still alive and healthy there. Uh, but uh, there's a lot more diversity because there's uh, people coming from other parts of the world. When, uh, Europe is not the only source of the population for Canada anymore. So because of this diversity in uh, the Canadian milieu, uh, the historical narrative is starting to be more reflective, like is that, that his, the heroic age, is it really all that heroic, you know? And we're kind of re, uh, looking back on that and amending our uh, sense of, of the past. Well, thank you again very much, thank you. Uh, and apologies for getting the names mixed up, I'm sorry for that. But thank you both very, very much. And we'll take a short break now for coffee and then the second session.